Colleagues and friends, what an honor it is for me to be welcoming you to the inaugural lecture by Professor Kavilan Mutli. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Senate and Council, as well as the entire community of UKZN, I welcome you to this August equation. The inauguration of Prof. Moodley signifies the desired growth in the professoriate at the University of Guazulu-Natal. Uh, the growth of what is already a, a formidable professor in, in the university. Generally though, the growth of the professor in our university is one of the critical success factors. Rising rankings, our leadership in research productivity, our improvement in teaching and learning indicators, as well as the deeper penetration of the university's community engagement. We are both known for our papers that we publish, the books that we write, and the patent. This growing club of the elite is not a snobbish thing, but it acts as a basis for the role modeling and setting of very high standards for the aspirations of emerging scholars. I do think that our professors here at, the U at UKZN have always set the bar high enough for of the emerging scholars both here and elsewhere to constantly pursue scholarship to reach and join this elite club. It also creates a tangible reference that both the skills and capabilities of our scholars and capabilities and skills are highly desired and sought after by industry and business. As you know, many of our scholars consult for big business, for government, and for society in general to provide solutions to research problematic issues in society and come up with solutions. So today you have come not only to witness the transition of one of us into this club of the elite, but also to hear what he professes and what he is doing at UKZM and what he will do in the future. This is going to excite some of us. It is also going to motivate some of us. It will create that valuable addition to the brand when people listen to one of our professors and are amazed at the things that we do here. As the professoriate grows at our university, so also does the capacity for creating new knowledge. And I say this because we are the leading producer in the country, and that makes us the leading knowledge producer in the continent. This is an enviable position. I'm not saying this to boast, but I'm saying this because constantly we are showcasing a wide variety of scholars in a wide variety of fields which testifies the capacity of imparting knowledge to the next generation. So this tripartite approach 
of creating new knowledge and making knowledge work for society and then imparting it to the next generation. It's one of the key success factors of the brand UKZN. And this is why I welcome you all to be part of the witness group who can attest to the enhancement of the aspiration, uh, inspiration towards greatness. I also want to say a special welcome to Professor Kavidan. Tell us about it. I want to take this opportunity now and hand over to the Dean Professor Celestina Viriri, who is going to introduce to us Professor Kavilan Motley. Thank you. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Sandra Songa, the Registrar and staff from the Registrar, University Executive Management present here, Professor G. Kavilan Motley and your family present here. Colleagues from the School of Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Science, and colleagues from the university, the entire university, and all invited guests. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kavilan Motley. He is currently full professor in the School of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science, and a director of the Astrophysics Research Center at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He completed his PhD in 2002 at the University of Cambridge, after which he worked as a postdoctoral researcher in astrophysics at the University of Oxford, before returning to South Africa in 2003 to take up an academic faculty position at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Kavilan's research interest is in the area of cosmology and involves confronting cosmological theories with observational data, in particular observations of the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure. Kavilan served as a scientific board member of the, of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope Project and as a member of the International Science Working Group for the Square Kilometer Array Project, and also as an associate editor for the South African Journal of Science. In 2007, Kavilan won the South African Institute of Physics Silver Jubilee Medal. In 2011, he was awarded a Fulbright Visiting Research Scholar Fellowship to Princeton University. And in, two, in 2020, in, in 2022, this year again, he was awarded a Fulbright Visiting Research Scholar Fellowship to the Flintron Institute of Sim of Institute at the Simons Foundation in New York. He served as a member of the NRF. Astronomy Advisory Council and the Sarau Science Advisory Committee. In 2020, he was elected to the Academy of Science of South Africa. Kavilan has published 110 research papers with over 8,500 citations and he has delivered invited lectures at a number of international conferences, including the International Dark Side of the Universe Conference in 2014 and the COSPA Scientific Assembly in 2018. He is currently the principal investigator of the Hirax Telescope Project, which aims to measure the evolution of dark energy and localize First radio best. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kavilan Mutli. 
Professor Kavilan Moodley, I invite you to deliver your lecture. Thank you. Um, can you hear me, uh, Professor Vivi? Yes, I can, can hear, hear you. you. Yes, you are audible. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, thanks for those very kind words, and I'm very honored to be giving this inaugural lecture. I just wanted to make uh, two observations. The first uh, uh, is that I'm, this is a hybrid uh, event, uh, even though it was planned to be online. I have some very special people here in the audience in person. And in addition, I have some very special friends and colleagues also joining online. So welcome to you. Um, uh, the other is an apology. Um, I guess the rules of the inaugural don't allow for any questions or a question and answer session at the end of my talk. So I do apologize for that, but uh, feel free to email me or WhatsApp me or call me or after this event, the in-person audience can ask me questions. So I'm, I'm very happy to respond to anything I present here. Uh, so let me begin. Uh, the title of my uh, talk is The Cosmic Odyssey and in the background, you can see the a concept design for the Hyrax telescope that we're planning to build in the Kuru Desert in South Africa. Uh, before I start, I should acknowledge some very special people, uh, my family in particular, my mom and dad, uh, my brother and sister, and uh, most, re you know, most recently on my journey, uh, Nishana, my very dear wife. And uh, I'll come back to you know, uh, thanking my mom who I'm gonna dedicate this talk to. And she's here uh, sitting in the front. So I'm very happy to see her here. Uh, and uh, oh, this journey is really uh, a cosmic odyssey for me. And let me unpack this a little. Uh, this journey is about very small, you know, the, the atom to, the, to our scale, the earth, to the scale of the stars, and then finally going out to the scale of the universe. So that's the journey I'm gonna take you on this, mor uh, this afternoon, uh, morning for some, uh, but there's another journey that's gonna be threaded through this, which is my journey in understanding and my journey in uh, you know learning about the universe, but also my journey with uh, very special people who mentored me and taught me along the way. So uh, this talk really is uh, a homage to those people. And I wasn't sure how to express my thanks. So I decided to write a poem, which I'm gonna quickly read to you now. <clears throat> Forged in the flames of your mind, I am born. Atomic in essence, complex in existence, bound by your energetic presence, I awake, honest in your orbit, emerging, nourished in the garden of your curiosity, amid, amidst weeds of doubt, relentlessly I grow, in the fertile earth of your knowledge, my spirit of inquiry blossoms, searching, illuminated by the sunshine of your wisdom, in my tireless quest, ever humble, I am inspired, your unwavering integrity holds me as I cast out the darkness of my ignorance, realizing in the vast cosmos of your compassion, my ego departed, I become conscious. Your courage inspires me, fighting inertia, I separate from your grasp, expanding. And uh, just a thank you for all the people, all the teachers and mentors that have inspired me along the way. Um, oops. So we can start, uh, when I was uh, in high school, uh, my brother gave me, and this is where my interest in science began. He gave me a, an Olympiad, math, you know, a maths Olympiad problem to solve. And I got hooked on that. And then uh, I should acknowledge Puval and Pele, who's here in the audience, and Sudan Hansraj, who really inspired me in those early years, along with my many teachers at high school. So thank you to you. And that's where my journey begins. Uh, and of course, We've been staring at the night sky for a long time. So these are uh, some South African uh, legends of the night sky. Uh, you can see here, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you can see the Pleiades, the Simalela, and many other interpretations of the night sky. So uh, this fascination with the night sky is kind of un universal and almost eternal. We look up in wonder, and we wonder what's out there. Uh, and I'm gonna take you on, on this journey. Uh, so we can start with the solar system. Uh, you know, this is our home. You can see the Earth here, a very fragile planet um, going around the sun. And uh, what holds it together 
is really gravity. And this is uh, Blake's um, kind of version of Newton, uh, Newton, the kind of architect of the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, Blake uh, writes, well, not to Newton, but uh, uh, in general, you know, you can see the poem here that's very uh, relevant for this talk. And so Newton, uh, you know, uh, understood gravity and used it to explain the orbits or uh, used it to explain you know, the attraction between two masses. And from there, you know, we could understand we had a theory for explaining the orbits of uh, the planets around the sun. Um, and the sun is special. Uh, it's a special star for us, but it's just another ordinary star. Uh, gravity is important in the universe, but so is pressure, especially in astrophysics. And so the star, uh, the sun is very really held together by this balance between gravity and pressure. So like the sun, many other stars, you know, have the same, um, you know, behavior. Um, and then zooming out further from our solar system, we can look at the night sky. And here's an image of the Meerkat telescope in the crude desert with the background Milky Way. And you can see it's, you know, it's fascinating. I encourage anyone who wants to see a, a beautiful night sky to come to the South African desert. Um, and you can, uh, so that's the center of our galaxy. Uh, and it's the kind of spiral arms in our galaxy. Uh, we, are, we live in a uh, spiral galaxy. Uh, and we can zoom further out to the realm of the galaxies. And these are images taken from the James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see that uh, these galaxies, which are large collections of stars, have all sorts of fascinating shapes and they come in different sizes as well. So in the center image is an elliptical galaxy and you can also see uh, you know, a quintet of galaxies on the right image and a cartwheel galaxy on the left image. So the universe you know is really wondrous and uh, we can you know go out further um, and this is an image uh, kind of a, a scaled image showing uh, us right at the center here in the solar system going out beyond the galaxies to the furthest distances we can see in the universe to the cosmic microwave background the earliest light and uh, you know after going beyond the distribution of the large scale distribution of matter in the universe so that's that's the cosmos. That's you know that's the journey we're on. And I just wanted to return to my journey. So my journey began as an undergraduate after I left high school at the University of Cape Town. I just wanted to acknowledge a few people who inspired me along the way. Igor Bereshenkov, uh, who uh, taught me a lot of applied mathematics. Peter Dunsby, who taught me you know general relativity, and George Ellis, who you know uh, I, and cosmology. Uh, I learned cosmology from. So thank you and acknowledgements to you. So uh, yeah, we returned to gravity. Uh, so I learned about general relativity and uh, the curvature of space-time, and you know that was thanks to the imagination of Einstein that this theory was uh, kind of born. Uh, and what it says is that uh, gravity is not just some random, or the way we understand gravity uh, is just not some random attraction between massive bodies, but Rather, the way to think about it is that gravity uh, bends uh, the space-time, just like if you placed a, a heavy metal ball on a rubber sheet, it will create an indentation. This, in the same way, uh, matter warps the space and time around it. And so this idea of space-time curvature is, you know, and, and uh, so it's closely coupled uh, to uh, understanding gravity. And then as particles move, uh, they move along these curved paths. They don't move on straight lines anymore. They move on these curved paths. And that's how we understand uh, gravity in terms of general relativity. And uh, this allows us to actually, this theory of general relativity, understanding gravity in this way, allows us to build a model for the universe. Those uh, images I showed you going out to larger and larger scales, we can actually write down a mathematical model that describes uh, that universe. and. Uh, you know, in in uh, in science, uh, especially in physics and mathematics, uh, aesthetics is very important to us. So symmetry is really a key factor here. So if we assume the universe has maximal symmetry, uh, you know, three uh, uh, symmetry in rotations and symmetry symmetry in translations, then there's only one uh, a, a few possibilities. Actually, these three possibilities for what the geometry of the universe uh, can be. And I'm showing you a picture here. And so uh, it can be a sphere, a spheroidal geometry, a hyperbolic geometry, which is the second image, 
or a flat geometry. So these are the three possibilities for the cosmological model. And what determines uh, what geometry has is actually the content of the universe. As I mentioned uh, with Einstein, if you, uh, you, know, you understand uh, gravity in terms of uh, matter distorting space and time. So the matter in the universe will determine the space-time geometry of uh, you know, the cosmological model. Uh, so, uh, and what we find is that there are kind of three, uh, uh, several pillars that tell us, you know, what our universe is like. Uh, and the first is uh, an ob observation that the universe is expanding. So as we look out in uh, space and time, we see galaxies moving away from us. And the way we understand that is not that we are at the center of the universe, but that everything in the universe is moving away from everything else. So we live in an expanding universe. That's a key observation, which is consistent with this uh, model that we build, the cosmological model. The second is that if the universe was expanding, then at some time in the past, it must have been much smaller and therefore much hotter because all the matter would have been condensed into a much smaller volume and all the radiation as well. So the universe was hotter and the, this heat from the Big Bang there must be some remnant of it. And this is the so-called cosmic microwave background. And shown there are a series of detections of the overall temperature of the microwave background, which is 2.73 degrees above absolute zero. And uh, uh, that was, you know, Penzias and Wilson uh, got the Nobel Prize for that uh, discovery. And uh, in future generations of uh, satellite experiments, uh, we uncovered the small fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background with ever increasing kind of precision and resolution. So what the cosmic microwave background tells us is that the universe had a hot beginning and hence the name the hot big bang, which is this uh, cosmological model I'm referring to. And we know uh, there's another line of evidence that tells us uh, we began in a hot uh, big bang, which is that the light elements were created um, a deuterium, uh, helium and lithium were created in this very early moments in the, uh, at the beginning of the universe. And to, to have created them, the universe needed to be very hot. And uh, so we have many lines of evidence that now point to this hot big bang model. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to, so that you know, was my excursion at, uh, as an undergraduate at the University of Cape Town. I moved on to the University of Natal, where I worked with Sunil Maraj and Kesh Govinda. Uh, on basically general relativity, taking the theory and applying it to a range of models in cosmology to try to understand, you know, if there were alternatives uh, uh, to this uh, uh, standard hot big bang cosmology. And so, you know, I was very grateful for that time being back in Durban. Uh, and then I moved on to the University of Cambridge, where I was uh, supervised by Neil Turok, who's shown here on the left, Martin Booker on, in the middle, and then I also want to acknowledge Roy Martins, who played a strong role in, even though he wasn't uh, formally my advisor, but he was at Portsmouth, but also played a strong role in my uh, kind of mentorship when I was in the UK. And I just wanted to reflect on something. Uh, I'm going to veer off, as you could tell from the poem, uh, you know, the standard uh, uh, slides on cosmology. I just wanted to talk about privilege or uh, maybe the lack of privilege as well. I think this is an important topic uh, you know, given where the world is today. Uh, so I would uh, have said growing up that I was very privileged, uh, but then I didn't know the greater world. And if I had known the greater world, I would have said I wasn't very privileged. In fact, uh, my high school, uh, you know, the teachers were excellent. Uh, we didn't have the same uh, resources as many, uh, you know, many of the other schools because we could, this was a kind of apartheid school where there were only uh, uh, students of Indian origin. And of course, uh, while I could have considered myself underprivileged, uh, I, I was not, I was much more privileged than many other, uh, you know, students my age across the country who uh, were being taught in Google schools and didn't have access to it, even lights or water. So privilege is, uh, you know, I think we need to understand and recognize our privilege and our lack of privilege as well. And I think we need to be honest about it. And so uh, I mentioned Neil in the previous slide when I arrived in Cambridge, and you can see a picture of uh, uh, Cambridge on the right, uh, uh, King's College uh, Chapel. 
uh, Neil uh, was amazed to learn that I came from a small town called Verulam, which is just north of Durban. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that was uh, you know, a, a, a strong statement about, you know, uh, just being over, able to overcome any kind of disadvantages one has. So I just wanted to you know, say, say this. Uh, and then what did I do at Cambridge? Uh, so I uh, used uh, observations of the cosmic microwave background to constrain uh, these models for the very uh, early fluctuations in the universe. I'll talk about these uh, fluctuations or irregularities in the distribution of matter and radiation. Uh, and uh, shown here are two different types of these fluctuations. One, and you don't need to know these terms, is called adiabatic, that's on the left and the other is called isocurvature on the right. And it's just two different ways in which the universe could have started off in, with these fluctuations. And what we studied uh, were these isocurvature models. In fact, we have strong evidence now from the cosmic microwave background that the uh, left hand, in the model on the left, the adiabatic model is, which is the simpler model is much preferred. But uh, we did a lot of work and including uh, during uh, my time at Oxford, uh, where I worked with uh, Pedro Ferreira and uh, also was inspired by Joseph as well. We did a lot of work on understanding these uh, uh, isocurvature perturbations and using the cosmic microwave background to try to constrain them. And so uh, the idea with these fluctuations is that these fluctuations are the seeds of the galaxies that form today. So shown here is a simulation where you start off with a very smooth universe and then it's slightly, there's small fluctuations, or one part in 100,000. And as uh, time evolves, uh, because the distribution is slightly irregular, gravity uh, kind of attracts. Uh, so all the matter goes into these slightly overdense regions and becomes more and more overdense. And eventually we see these galaxies forming. So these uh, seeds uh, that you can observe early on in the cosmic microwave background, which I'll show you an image of now, uh, it grow over time and into the present day to become the distribution of galaxies that I've been showing you in the previous slides. Uh, so here's, here's a picture of the early universe. And this is a picture of the leftover heat from the Big Bang. And you can see these fluctuations, which I've shown you in a previous slide. And you can see this pattern of irregularities. And that tells us that uh, this model we have for how structure originated is you know, on the right track. We have these small fluctuations in the light or radiation, and these are also present in the matter, and the fluctuations in the matter grow over time to form galaxies. Right. Uh, with observations of the cosmic microwave background, the map I showed you, because it's so rich in structure, we can actually extract a lot of information about the universe. For example, we can constrain the content of the universe in terms of what, it, what makes up its energy. And we can also constrain other parameters like the nature of these fluctuations. As I told you, we you know, uh, studied these isocurvature versus adiabatic fluctuations uh, when, while I was at Cambridge and at Oxford. Uh, and so what we find is that there's this mysterious component called dark energy which makes up about 69% of the energy in the universe, whereas there's a, the matter, total matter, which is uh, uh, basically the, uh, like the regular matter we know, uh, that only makes up 31%. Of that 31%, 80% of that 31% is actually dark matter, so it doesn't shine like the matter around us. And regular matter is only about 20%. And of this regular matter, it comes in the form of stars and galaxies and dust and gas. So that's the cosmic energy budget. And that's interesting because there's two things on the page there that uh, we're calling dark. What it means is dark is really uh, showing our ignorance. We don't know what these things are. So we suitably give them a name, dark energy and dark matter, but we're working very hard to try to figure that out. Uh, so uh, I came back to, the, uh, to uh, uh, South Africa after uh, Oxford, and I came back to the University of Puzzle and Mattel, and I was uh, told that as soon as I get back, I have to take on uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows because they will keep me on my toes and keep me excited about what I do. And so that's what I did. I followed that very useful advice. And so I'm showing here uh, probably a dozen of my students and postdocs. 
I sent an email out for them to send me pictures and these are the ones who sent me pictures. I haven't included more. I've had many more graduate students and postdocs, but uh, thanks to all of them and in particular to the ones, you know, that are shown here. Um, and so that period at UKZN was uh, really about getting involved and trying to understand, you know, uh, study the cosmic microwave background in more detail, but also to understand the distribution of these galaxies, the so-called large scale structure that we see. So shown here is a map of the, the a 3D map of the galaxies in the universe. Uh, and uh, basically as you go out from the center, which is where we are observing, uh, you can see further and further away. Right, and you see this uh, kind of foamy, frothy structure with filaments and uh, voids, etc. Right, and we can actually predict the structure very well using uh, computer simulations. So, uh, but there's some fascinating things hidden in there. For example, we spoke about dark matter and dark energy. Uh, can we use observations of this large scale structure to understand dark matter and dark energy more? And so uh, I became involved in the Atacama Cosmology Telescope soon after, or actually on the verge of returning to UKZN. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the, you know, the uh, Lyman Page, uh, who was the PI of ACT at the time, and then Suzanne Staggs, who took over as PI, and then uh, David Spurgle, who I've known you know, for a very long time and has hosted me uh, you know, at Princeton and at the Simons Foundation. And uh, thanks to them for the inspiration. Uh, so with ACT, we studied galaxy clusters. And in fact, I haven't asked uh, this student of mine, but this, this is in a recent paper that is submitted to the journal, uh, showing meerkat observations of uh, this galaxy cluster that we discovered with ACT. It was uh, in a first discovered with ACT. And uh, I'm not showing you the, here's the optical image in the background here. In the front is the radio image. And you can see lots and lots of galaxies. The fact that they are red, tells you it's at a very distant, uh, it's very uh, far away from us. And then you can see X-rays, and this is called uh, El Gordo, the, the fat one. And you can see uh, the X-ray distribution of this uh, uh, in X-rays. And then you can see the radio distribution. And this is uh, kind of very hot of the press observations from the Meerkat uh, telescope. And so you can see these are really fascinating objects and uh, are key to us understanding the evolution of uh, large scale structure in the universe. Another project I worked on uh, with a master's student, uh, well, several master's students uh, was gravitational lensing of the cosmic microwave background. So as uh, light travels to us today from the cosmic microwave background, it gets warped or bent, bent by the matter. As I told you earlier, uh, the matter curves spacetime. So these uh, light particles will actually bend around uh, the matter and uh, that causes an effect called lensing, very much like uh, the lenses in your uh, spectacles. And uh, we worked on a project to uh, reconstruct uh, the distribution of matter in the universe, the dark matter. And uh, this is just a result showing agreement to the red uh, spots here are meant to line up with the dashed lines and the blue spots are meant to line up with the solid lines. And so we, we developed a new technique to actually measure the effect of this lensing of the cosmic microwave background. So then um, I also want to acknowledge colleagues that I've, uh, you know, I've been a, a long time at the university as a faculty member and uh, I've engaged with many colleagues and I just want to acknowledge, uh, again, not all of them sent me their pictures, but uh, these are the ones that did. And uh, thank you for your inspiration while I've been, you know, based at UKZM. Uh, we've had some interesting times, uh, let me leave it at that. Uh, and then of course I should uh, acknowledge the large astronomy community and uh, thanks to many People in uh, many colleagues in the astronomy community, in particular, um, you know, I've been inspired by Bernie Fanaroff, who's given me lots of good advice over the years, and many, many others. Um, so thank you, and I hope Bernie's on. Uh, he, he said he would join. Uh, so shown here is an image of the Su Southern African Large Telescope. So this is the, an optical telescope in Sutherland, and also uh, on the right is an image of the Meerkat Telescope, uh, which is in uh, just outside a town called Carnarvon. Uh, in the Northern Cape. So uh, I think the idea with showing this image is to show that astronomy is really uh, you know, uh, thriving in South Africa. We have a very large community that's growing and it's a very exciting place to be to do this science. And so the science that we've been thinking about recently and I'll move on. Uh, let me just check uh, my time. 
Okay, it seems I'm okay. So uh, um, the science that we're thinking about uh, now and the project that I'm working on, uh, Hyrax, uh, relates to this accelerating universe. So uh, what surprised us, and uh, we discovered this through observations of uh, kind of exploding stars uh, called type 1a supernova, is that the universe, the galaxies are moving away from each other, but instead of slowing down in that motion, they're actually speeding up. So the universe is accelerating. And this uh, was really puzzling. It wasn't expected, it wasn't on the menu, uh, but we really need to understand this now. Uh, and uh, what's causing, what's driving this accelerated expansion is something we call dark energy, which has a negative pressure. So it's almost like an, if you want to think about it, like an anti-gravity. And so what are the properties of this dark energy? Incidentally, um, Einstein, when he first developed these static cosmological model, he introduced this uh, cosmological constant, which is an option for the dark energy. And so the question today is the dark energy, this cosmological constant, which uh, in turn you know, has its own uh, kind of challenges in terms of explaining it, uh, it's kind of a vacuum energy, uh, or is it some other field uh, of, uh, or kind of uh, energy uh, field that's uh, changing in time and changing in space? So that's the big question uh, and probably one of the foremost questions in the field of today. And the way we're going to actually uh, uh, probe this is through a very special gift of nature called uh, these baryon acoustic oscillations or rings of power, as I uh, call it here. Uh, so these, uh, uh, this is a unique lens scale in the universe. So we actually have been given a cosmic ruler by nature. And this uh, show is shown here, this length here. Um, which is uh, approximately about 500 uh, million uh, light years or 450 million light years. Uh, so this lens scale, uh, actually, can, we can measure this lens scale and we can measure it over time. And that allows us to actually uh, uh, track the expansion of the universe. And recently, as I just showed you on the previous slide, dark energy has come to dominate that expansion. So what that means is we can understand dark energy by following the evolution of this lens scale, this cosmic ruler. Right? And we've already detected that uh, this uh, in uh, using observations of galaxies, but we would like to push further out and go to more distant times so that we can understand how dark energy came to dominate the universe. And so uh, this was the idea behind uh, developing the hydrogen intensity mapping and real time analysis experiment or Hyrax, or a suitably contrived uh, name as is common in astronomy. And in fact, the Hyrax uh, is uh, a DASI, which is a resident of the Peru. So it's, uh, you know, closest relative is an elephant. So it's a small furry creature here. Uh, so um, Hyrax will, uh, the plan is to build this on the uh, SK site in the Peru, where there's excellent infrastructure. And the goal of Hyrax is to detect this, cos to measure this cosmic ruler, using observations of hydrogen in the universe and uh, follow its evolution and thereby constrain dark energy. So that's the main uh, uh, thing I'm working on currently. It's a, so it's a large collaboration. So let me just get one. IDAX is a large collaboration with about eight South African institutions and then about 17 partners abroad. So it's, it's a big project and uh, most recently, uh, you know, we partnered with the Simons Foundation, which is really exciting as well. Um, and uh, the important thing here is location. So shown here, well, for radio uh, astronomy, I should say, cell phones and, you know, other uh, kind of uh, terrestrial uh, signals are the bane of, uh, you know, a radio astronomers' life. And so shown here is a, a map of the cell phone coverage in uh, uh, South Africa. And you can see that it's very, uh, you know, there's, there's not much in the Kuru Desert. And in fact, government has instituted uh, legislation to protect the radio uh, quietness of the site. And so we benefit from that. We also benefit from the investments in infrastructure and uh, data that uh, have been put in place. So we're quite close to uh, what, what is called the SK, but where Meerkat is currently. Uh, and this is kind of a, a picture of the site. Um, so there are other Hyraxes, as I mentioned, the DASI, and then we didn't know that there was a trash metal band called Hyrax as well. Uh, so this is the Hyrax instrument. Um, uh, we've got dishes, as I showed you in the previous cartoon. We actually uh, decided uh, to go with composite dishes 
So the, these dishes then reflect the radio radiation, the radio waves, and they're detected by these receivers, uh, the speed here, and then transmitted or, or over fiber to uh, a big kind of supercomputing backend. We first process the signals using these kind of uh, uh, FPGA boards. Uh, and so this is an, an image of what this whole system will look like, but this is in the case of Chime. Uh, and then uh, for us, uh, we then these signals are then correlated uh, using this uh, GPU uh, system, which we call an X engine. So that, that's the, the basic hardware. Um, and uh, another point I want to talk about is, uh, is failure. Uh, we started this project in 2014. We've had a lot of bumps along the way uh, and, and failures. We went out uh, on tender to build, uh, to procure these dishes on two occasions and failed on two occasions. But we've now found a solution and a way forward. So we hopeful, you know, the, we're moving uh, full steam ahead, and we're hoping uh, or planning to have dishes in the crew built by the middle of next year. So uh, I think, uh, you know, um, and this again, I thank my mentors, you know, for encouraging me to keep uh, pursuing. Uh, you have to keep uh, dreaming and keep pursuing those dreams. Uh, you know, don't let uh, any failures stop you. In fact, failures are important to uh, eventually succeed. So to the young people in the audience, uh, I think that's an important lesson. And you should take risks and, you know, and fail because if you don't take risks, you'll never do anything exciting. Uh, so with uh, Hyrax, we uh, plan to constrain dark energy. This plot may not mean a lot to you, but basically the smaller these uh, 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 kind of uh, shaded regions are, the better. And for the experts in the audience, I'll say that with the uh, Hyrax expanded up to a thousand dishes, we plan to uh, constrain uh, the, this is the pressure, the ratio of pressure to energy or the stiffness of the dark energy and uh, today, and then any change in that stiffness over time. And so the smaller these contours are, the better. And if the contours settle at this point, that is the cosmological constant that I was talking about. So that if we uh, make a detection away from that point, that would be very exciting. We'd be uh, detecting some kind of dynamical dark energy, right? And so we can measure these parameters at the, roughly the one percent level, okay? Which is really impressive, and that's what other big projects, you know, international projects are also aiming to do. Uh, for the uh, experts, uh, for uh, for this contours, our figure of merit is uh, around about three hundred, I believe. Uh, and so the other kind of interesting science we're doing with Hyrax, and I've been doing this with a few students is uh, uh, looking at combining Hyrax data with data from other telescopes. So I mentioned ACT. ACT has been upgraded to Advanced ACT Hole and will then uh, and will be then superseded by the Simons Observatory, which is you know, currently uh, uh, close to being completed. And the Simons Observatory, those measurements will cover the same region of sky that uh, Hyrax is covering. So I should say this is a, a kind of ast astronomical coordinates uh, basically, we are mapping this whole strip of sky between zero degrees and minus 60 degrees. And we'll also overlap with uh, projects like the Rubin uh, LSST project and with many other surveys. So this gives us a unique opportunity to understand the large scale structure in the universe through hydrogen, but also uh, other observations like the cosmic microwave background and through the optical and infrared emission from galaxies. So uh, we've been doing some work on uh, looking if one can combine Hyrax with uh, CMB surveys, and in particular, the lensing of the cosmic microwave background that I mentioned. The problem with that is, um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but for the experts in the audience, uh, when we, uh, call it, you know, to detect the signal, the hydrogen signal, we actually have to remove our galaxy, which is very bright. And in doing so, one actually removes the uh, uh, kind of uh, signal that would correlate or uh, couple to the CMB uh, signal. And so one actually has to just do a direct correlation. One has to uh, go to a higher order correlation, which we call the spy spectrum. And the, the, the idea with the bi spectrum is that uh, in regions which are very dense, so they have a lot of matter, the fluctuations grow more. And in regions which are less dense, the fluctuations grow less because there's less matter, so less gravity. And so uh, what this means is that uh, since uh, you lose these large scale uh, signals, uh, when you remove the foregrounds, you can actually recover them 
by using the small scale information. So we've done that and uh, we're putting out a paper uh, on the archive shortly. Um, and what you find is quite interesting constraints. Uh, you can improve the uh, constraints on uh, dark energy. You can constrain, you can break uh, various uh, tension or degeneracies between uh, uh, you know, the structure, the amplitude of the structure and the, its kind of evolution. And then here I'm showing some beyond the standard uh, model parameters. So the neutrino mass, for example, we expect to get uh, uh, constraints. Uh, this is the sum of all the neutrino, massive neutrinos. Uh, we expect to get constraints at the level of 10 milli electron volts, which is highly competitive with other uh, surveys. And uh, also shown here are constraints on the curvature of the universe, the geometry that I showed you earlier, and constraints on the evolution of the dark energy stiffness. Okay, so I think uh, that's uh, it uh, in terms of the science I've been doing. I just wanted to make a few uh, concluding comments uh, that as I spoke about privilege earlier, we're very privileged in astronomy and cosmology to have all these amazing facilities that are coming online. They very expensive facilities, so you know we have a duty uh, as scientists to you know make the most of it and also communicate to the public you know what we are doing and why we're doing it. Um, and I think we have a scientific responsibility. So I saw this uh, poster at MIT when I was visiting, and I really liked it. And I think you know these are strong values that sometimes I think in uh, in the pursuit of science we lose sight of, and it's important to remember them. Uh, you know, uh, well-being, respect, inclusion, collaboration, and mentorship, right? And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, just, uh, I mean, many of the people I know uh, uphold these values, but sometimes in our rush to move forward in science, we sometimes forget this. So I think it's something useful to come back to. And I think we have a broader responsibility beyond our scientific responsibility. We also have an, uh, a, a role in society, I think, as scientists, but also as academics, but also as people. And, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in physics, we like to think about very simple things. So if you're doing particle physics at the Planck scale, you know, or, or even, uh, you know, the standard model, uh, we, we rely on symmetry. We, you know, it's the aesthetics that move us forward. At the Hubble scale, on the other end of the spectrum, things are very simple as well. I showed you the picture of those three geometries, you know, very simple, highly symmetric. And so in between, I think, you know, is where the complexity arises, you know, where the world becomes messy. And that's, that's our human scale. And I think it's worth us thinking about, you know, as scientists, you know, how do we engage with that? And in particular, you know, we're going through a very challenging time. Maybe, you know, the past things were just as bad, but, uh, you know, things uh, really seem very challenging at the moment. It's, it's really a brave new world we need to get into. And uh, there's many things that are, you know, uh, uh, disrupting our, our world. And I think we should uh, both as scientists and as uh, human beings, you know, engage with that. So I just wanted to end there. And uh, the final slide, uh, I mentioned that I'd like to dedicate this uh, uh, talk uh, or, you know, uh, to my mother. Uh, she's sitting here in the front, uh, smiling at me. And uh, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, when I was in high school, and I think I have a few minutes to indulge in this uh, uh, comment. When I was in uh, uh, high school, uh, I would uh, not be very diligent at doing my homework when I returned. In fact, I was on the sports field most of, uh, most of the afternoon and was too exhausted to do any homework. So uh, my mother would wake me up at 4 a.m. in the morning. So many of you have received emails from me at 4 a.m. in the morning. So uh, this is the lady who's uh, responsible for that. She's sitting here in front. So I would uh, do all my homework in a period of one or two hours in the morning before I went to school. And so uh, I persisted with that habit. And uh, you know, thanks, thanks to my mom for inspiring me, but also my dad and my uh, siblings uh, at an early stage for inspiring me on this uh, you know, uh, academic path. And uh, so uh, to end off, I wrote, a, I wrote another poem in dedication of my mother. Uh, so I'd like to thank her and I'll read it out to her. So she, uh, my mother was a teacher, and this is a picture from one of her uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, teacher's photographs when she was at school. Uh, so this poem, and uh, I think we've come through a very difficult time these last few years. I think a lot of us have understood uh, uh, you know, uh, what vulnerability is. And uh, so uh, here's something very vulnerable. And 
of course, also dealt with loss. And so this is, uh, uh, you know, something I'd like to uh, dedicate to my mom. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she's uh, had Parkinson's for the last 20 years. So, but she's very brave and very courageous. And uh, so I dedicate this to her. Um, and I think I have a few minutes left to uh, read this out. So I'll read this out. Uh, and the poem is entitled Mother. <coughs> so let me just take a sip of water. Uh, mother, I have drunk from your bosom a deep well of love. Your heart withers away, yet I continue to feel deeply. I have drunk from your bosom a deep well of knowledge. Your mind withers away, yet I continue to learn deeply. I have drunk from your bosom a deep well of embrace. Your body withers away, yet I continue to serve deeply. Where are you, little bird? Your song reaches me at dawn, lifts my spirit, yet I wait longingly at dusk, darkness impending, and your silence fills the air. At night I sleep deeply, my ship sailing a vast sea of dreams, adrift in a haze of longing, I am lost without you. Then I hear your sweet song, a beacon across the expanse, guiding me home, and I return to myself. Arising to the tranquility of dawn, I sense you with me, thinking, feeling, acting. Your glowing essence inspires me onward. My fragile path arcs into the dark future, but in your radiance, I am fearless. Thank you. Thank you, Abong. Yeah. I, I want to say a vote of thanks. The trouble with the vote of thanks is that you almost always forget somebody. So I devise a strategy. I'm going to divide it into three groups. The first group is the Kavilan group. The second group is the, the audience group. The third group is the UKZN group. The prototype of the Kavilan group, I was considering who is going to be the proxy. Sorry, Kavilan, you didn't make the grade. Your mother. Sorry, uh, you... sorry, Prof. I'm saying I'm I'm uh, sorry you didn't make the grade for the. Uh, proxy of your group, your mother did. <laughs> She's an amazing person. Um, so on behalf of the Kavlan group led by your mother, I want to say a profound word of gratitude to the woman who brought you into this world and your dad, the man who was beside her, and your entire family, which we saw earlier. We at UKZN are indebted to you, particularly indebted to your mother. She is obviously a great woman. She... Uh, is proud, correctly so, of what has happened here, in particular, but generally of what has happened in your life up to here and beyond. Thank you, Kavilan, and you have given us a great presentation and outstanding tribute to cosmology. I have to confess though that uh, 
chemist personally, my, and, uh, um, I understood uh, less than 1% of what you were talking about, but I'm sure that there are people in this audience that understood what you're talking about. Uh, and uh, I couldn't help though, getting a sense uh, of the fact that it is quite profound. It is quite um, cutting edge. It's the kind of stuff that makes knowledge creation to be well worth the effort. Thank you very much, Kabila. And please do convey our gratitude to your family, especially your mother. To the audience, I, I want to thank you for attending this inauguration. Today we listened to one of our proudest sons in the university. He has been to the highest mountains, Cambridge, Oxford, but he's now here with us and he's doing these things. I did confess that I'm not quite sure that I understand what it is he's doing, but he's doing these things here. I want to therefore thank the audience for attending today's inauguration to be a well worth while event. And of course, without you, um, I think Kavlan's family would have felt that, uh, you know, Kavlan doesn't belong somewhere, but you came. Everybody from that family now knows that there is a place called UKZN and there are people there that Kavilan works with. Thank you for coming. Then I want to thank the UK, University of Kozulu Natal. These are the obscure people that I want to acknowledge. Today they are represented by Mark Tufts. Whoever registered in this university, Kathleen Clearland, on the dot, every day, inaugural lectures happen. All the professors that must be inaugurated in each year, they are inaugurated because there's a system behind the acknowledgement of the professoriate and the transitioning of our scholars into the professor professoriate. And that system is led by our registrar. Dr. Kathleen Clearland and her team. And I want to thank Dr. Clearland. Within that same group are the people that made these events. The CRD, our executive director, Norma Zondo, who makes these things happen. I want to acknowledge them. To all of you then, I'm seriously and very grateful uh, for your contribution. Thank you so, so much. I believe, Pam, we will hand over to you now.